Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask all the speakers now to, to um, come to the front and sit at the table. We have, um, including you, Amanda, <laughs> uh, we have 22 minutes uh, before the coffee break for questions and discussion. And uh, I'm sure we all are very interested in uh, asking uh, the, the panel questions to learn more about how we could put into place a, a stringent system to ensure that reporting is relevant, that it's about the core business, like Amanda said, about how the, the performance of, of the core business of the company and how it can be made reliable, which uh, empirical studies show that uh, often is not the case. Uh, I would remind the panel participants, you are many today, to, to help each other to use the microphone when you're speaking. Those microphones can be moved, so, but just make sure you speak into them. Thank you. Okay, we will start with uh, Masia. Um, this question is for sorry, sorry. Hi. This question is for Charlotte, but anyone can answer. Um, I'm assuming when you were talking about work being done on materiality, you might have been talking about SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Maybe you weren't. I'm not sure. Um, but for those that don't know, that's uh, an organization. Uh, it's a nonprofit, but it's working to have uh, sustainability factors. Uh, looked at with a materiality standard that's industry specific um, so that when companies are reporting, publicly traded companies are reporting on their 10Ks or 20Fs, they're not using the GRI factors and GRI now has gone into GRI 4 which also has materiality but that it's industry specific so that investors can look at materiality in a way that matters to them. I don't know if that's what you were talking about or not but um, your thoughts on that and then your thoughts on at least what's been going on in the United States is, a, is a business groups and even um, the head of the SEC has said recently in speeches that she believes investors are suffering from disclosure overload. Um, and so how does that comport with what the panelists have set up here and how uh, different groups of investors might think of this level of information? Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, actually, no, I was, I was um, thinking of a report that I, I came across at the UN the other day, and it was called um, Knowing and Showing by um, Cynthia Williams. Right. Um, well, um, I obviously haven't had time to read that in depth. I just picked it up there the other day. But um, it seems to me that materiality is something that we, we really do have to sort out um, because it, it's such a key concept mm. and it also seems to me that we haven't sorted it out. Um, so any work that's going on would be um, interesting for us to explore and also for us to explore from this particular perspective. Um, I, I, for me, the jury's out on that one at, at this point in time. I'm, I'm not sure what is really material and what isn't. It depends on who the recipients are. But I certainly agree with you about the danger of um, information overload. That is a major issue, and it has been for a long time. Like, that is nothing new. It's just getting worse. Mm -hmm. And so um, a, a key issue is to, I think, somehow go back to basics with, with reporting and think about why we why we have reporting and I, I for a long time have been arguing that this should be about communication and discussion you don't just report and just leave it there I think that it's it should be an opportunity for genuine discussion not just by the investors but actually by anybody affected and and who has a really genuine interest thank you uh, the next question is from Eric Rusek at the back there uh, I think it's a very important uh, point that you that you that you were discussing now because we we also have a situation with regulatory fatigue that companies yeah. are so tired of these compromise fixes about more reporting without this really being about the core business. Eric, please go ahead. Thank you. I don't think there are many examples of changing people's thinking mm. by making them reporting. Uh, in shipping, we have this um, huge reporting exercise uh, for ship uh, safety management. And uh, there, there's a great industry making these reports yeah. and routines, mm. and mm. nothing <clears throat> has changed. Mm. So perhaps this is not really the way to go. And uh, I think we should try to 
think about how it is to be the person who should report. And if we just change hats a little bit and think about ourselves as university employees, because most of us are, uh, I do not think we believe really in that reports will do much good mm -hmm. to what we actually do and how we do it. And the second thing is that we need to think what these reports are going to be used for. For my part, I submit about a dozen reports a year uh, at this university that I know no one will read. And I think uh, quite a few of them <laughs> will not be read, or the others will not be read either. And it's, it simply doesn't suffice to say that it's nice to have this information and we should discuss them, not only investors, but others too. We, we, we just need to have a clear view mm -hmm. of what this information is going to be used for and how it will be used. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, anybody in the panel want to comment on that? Charlotte? I don't want to hog it, so no. if anybody else wants to. Joka wants to hog yeah, it. Yes, I mean, um, I mean many, many, many of the, um, the speakers here and, and also you, you, you have made very, very serious, <coughs> serious remarks concerning this idea that reporting, reporting is, is, is a, a way forward. So, and, and so are we now, when we who are now proposing these, these reporting uh, requirements, so maybe we are taking the wrong path and maybe, as we they have been now, now discussing about, about certain, for instance, international financial reporting uh, standards, so should we concentrate back to financial accounting and developing the existing standard set, set and not trying for overarching let's say, uh, visions that cannot be realized, uh, really, and that cause this, 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 this uh, overload of, of, of information that makes it more and more difficult to, to, to separate relevant and, and irrelevant uh, information. So I think that there have been serious concerns, and I must reconsider consider my own thoughts concerning, concerning where should we concentrate on reporting in the future. Thank you. Okay, David. First. Uh, I think... Does it work? Yeah. yeah. I think uh, there, is, there is an example in which reporting actually changed in a way business. And uh, if you look at the 1970s, there was a lot of debate about social environmental reporting already, uh, also how to regulate it. And then uh, there was this movement towards uh, a creation of global only financial uh, reporting uh, system. And the fact that uh, Many, com many countries uh, outside the UK and the US uh, actually um, adopted this system of only financial uh, reporting that I think it was a great uh, boost for uh, the financialization of the world. Mm. And what is going on now is just very limited reporting on, no on uh, non-financial or sustainability. So that's used, and it's used more mostly for a reputational reason. Thank you, Rafa. Um, in, in terms of the information overload, I would you know, disagree with that point because I think when we think of an information overload, we're talking maybe too much with our investor hat on. And I think with this information, we have to use it properly in terms of safe information about safety practices in the shipping sector. I mean, similar uh, cases in the energy sector in relation to safety for uh, coal, gas, oil, and we have to make economists use this information on safety, factor it into their models that this safety practices actually should cost money. Are they doing enough? Uh, you know, we could probably answer, probably not. So they should, be, you know, it's about the use of this information. And certainly with a lawyer's hat on, you know, the more information you have, usually the better. You know, let's let the companies give themselves a rope. 
Okay, Charlotte, would you Just like very, to very briefly? briefly yes, yes. Um, <laughs> a small anecdote from, from research that I've done. Um, I came across a story of um, some companies having to resort to putting freebies in the packet to make sure that their shareholders would at least open it. <laughs> Just because they don't open, even open the envelope uh, with the annual report in. Um, so it's a bit like children's comics with those cheap toys on the front. Um, but more seriously, I, th I think I, I'm, I've got mixed feelings about all of this reporting stuff as well. I have to be honest about that. I feel that um, by us kind of participating in, in this, we, I don't want to be seen to be just going along with it because I think it's also a rather lazy approach. We just set down, oh, there's a problem. Let's deal with it with disclosure and transparency. And there is a danger with that. Having said that, that does tend to be the way that it goes. So I think it's important that people who are sitting from our perspective get involved in that debate and that we, we can actually influence it and, and perhaps turn reporting into something more positive than it has been so far. Mm. Thank you. We now, uh, we now have uh, five people on the list uh, and 11 minutes left, so I'm not putting more people on the list now. Um, the next is uh, Lorraine uh, up there. And while Lorraine is getting the microphone, I'd just like to put forward the question, is that information overload is the problem that is, a lot of it isn't really information? I'll just leave that out there. Lorraine. Thank you. Um, just a, I, I, not the point I wanted to make, but um, uh, about the disclosure issue. I, I heard an interesting paper a few weeks ago about um, how disclosure actually makes the recipient very passive, that the fact that you've been given something means that you, you no longer want to criticise it because obviously the person mm. disclosing must be being honest, otherwise they wouldn't, they wouldn't be disclosing. But that's a sort of a side point. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the sort of question and point that I had was um, based on something that somebody said yesterday, Anders said something very striking, I thought, which was that um, the negative externalities created by companies exceed the value that they create. Incredibly striking thing to say. Um, and it struck me that if, if you were successful in getting um, companies to report on their, um, on their impact, you would sort of create a, um, a, a whole range of companies that were essentially bankrupt. You know, they weren't, they, they, uh, they, were, they were losing more than they were making. Let me th think of the... Um, uh, Eastern Europe at the, the point of transition where um, so many companies were just technically bankrupt. They'd been sort of existing for a while, but actually when you looked at their productivity, they were technically bankrupt. And one might be doing the same in a different context with, with companies in the, in the capitalist world. Um, they are you know, technically bankrupt if, if you're successful in doing that. Um, so that's sort of a sort of point question. And the other smaller question was um, the issue of stakeholders. How, how do you get stakeholders involved with without um, involving capture, because it, it does seem that stakeholders um, are going to be uh, very ill-informed um, for, for various reasons, and so capture is a, is a very, very sort of real um, problem. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, the, the panel to, to make notes for, for the different comments and questions from the, from the uh, audience and ask the, uh, the, the other people on the list now to, to keep their comments um, short. One, microphone here, please. The next three are, are on the same row here, so you can just pass the microphone along. Yeah, um, two very quick questions. Um, about them, yeah, we'd like to hear the, the panel views on, on that choice between integrated reporting or keeping the divide between financial and non-financial information. So, what would you your view and then your reasons for that? Um, and then to, to Mr. Miech uh, from, the, from, the, from the commission, uh, if you can elaborate on the planning activities of the commission uh, regarding investors in their sustainability, that would be great. Um, to Mrs. Sonnenfeld, um, I know that there are other standards in this area uh, prepared by, by other initiatives and use some are endorsed by multi-stakeholder initiatives, such as the Global Reporting Initiative. Have you considered them and whether they are worthy to, to consider? Thank you. Um, as a person that have, uh, I'm, from, I'm working for the city of Oslo, and uh, as a person who has reported a lot, 
both in the private sector and also for the city when it comes to environmental issues, sustainability issues, and things like that. I, I tend to agree with Amanda to sort of think it through because there is a lot of reporting that creates from people that are very engaged, they get angered, pissed off, tired of endless reporting that goes nowhere. Mm -hmm. So, but I've also had experiences of reporting is really good and to kind of put attention to a point or to kind of raise awareness, it, it can be good. And if it's against a purpose that is sustainable first, in systems change, you change the purpose, you change much more, but if you're just mulling around with the numbers, it doesn't change that fast. But when it's aligned with a purpose that goes in the same direction and you limit to what is really needed, then it has a powerful effect, yeah. in my experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <clears throat> just a quick uh, comment on the reliability of, of, of the reporting, which I find interesting. Um, we've seen the same when we go to SMEs in Norway with my consultancy here, that they don't, they feel that, why is it necessary? They do it, but it's all, almost automatic. The big companies, they take it more seriously. Um, it's interesting to notice your comments on the reliability or the lack thereof and the need for standards because there's a huge business out there selling this information. It's called Bloomberg and he's made millions on it yeah. using that kind of reliable or not reliable information. And we talk to them a lot here in Norway and they say we are always reactive and rely on the information we get. So mm. that's interesting. Um, and, and finally, please don't stop reporting. Because <laughs> we need that information. Yes, it's information overload, perhaps, so refine it and make it better. And I think that's what you've been saying. You go back to 1987, sustainable development got onto the agenda. Everybody laughed at it. It's still with us. It's complicated. It's not really understood. 1987 up until today, today is a short time in understanding this. Go back to the, the discussions on UNFCCC and, and climate. The discussions on the veracity of the report were immense 10 years ago. Washava last week. They agree on the facts, now they quarrel about who's going to pay it. So, refine it, don't stop it, we need the reports. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, I would certainly echo that. Uh, I mean, uh, reporting is a necessary first step. It's more a comment than a, than, a, than, a, than a question. But reports need to be exploited, they need to be read, they need to be compared, benchmarked, and exposed. And uh, uh, the, the media have, have a role to play in, the, in, in that. Uh, I, I remember a few years back, there was a, a, a very interesting initiative uh, from uh, Eurosif, uh, the uh, European Foundation of uh, Sustainable Investors, uh, uh, and uh, uh, which you know, <clears throat> passed a partnership with the, uh, a group of uh, uh, large newspapers uh, all over Europe. And they regularly, monthly, or every quarterly, uh, reported just a, a page in the paper on you know, uh, how uh, a few big companies uh, uh, declared uh, uh, their performance on a number of grounds, be it uh, climate change uh, uh, acti mm -hmm. related activities or, or, or social activities. And that is p powerful because it reaches the uh, person in the street. Uh, as regard the, uh, the uh, uh, and this has you know, uh, somehow disappeared, and uh, I think this type of initiative should be uh, revived and, uh, uh, and multiplied. It's only by uh, you know, reading and comparing these reports and making, uh, but the comparison is always uh, tricky, and because the norms are, are, are different, the indicators are var vary, and uh, you know, it's, it's not uh, a trivial matter. But I think also academia uh, needs to uh, look into that, and uh, it's probably not only the, uh, the law uh, schools, but, uh, but the economists that mm. need to uh, really uh, pay attention to that. Uh, as regards uh, investors' uh, sustainability, uh, uh, I just, uh, I mean, I, I could uh, speak for, for, for hours on that, but I just would like to mention on the uh, uh, recent uh, um, green paper on uh, long-term financing that the Commission has issued, which is going to be followed by a, an action plan early next year. 
uh, I don't know exactly. Uh, I have a, fa a vague idea of some of the elements that might feature in this uh, ac action plan, but I think it is uh, uh, one of the uh, vehicles where uh, we can uh, try and uh, put forward some, some, some ideas. Uh, uh, we work also with our colleagues from DigiMarked on uh, the uh, uh, follow-up to their green paper on uh, disaster uh, uh, insurance, on risk. Uh, uh, and uh, again, there uh, we are looking at how we can try and influence the follow-up to that. Thank you. Thank you. And we will move on to uh, uh, both uh, investors and insurance uh, off, off to the break. But now the panel has... Uh, um, literally 90 seconds to respond <laughs> if we don't want to keep people from their coffee break. Yes, uh, just very three, three very short comments. Um, first, um, the GRI is a reporting standard, and what I was talking about was really the assurance standard. So they, they actually work on different standards. Um, I think what's quite important is that we, we shouldn't stop reporting because at this point in time, it is, it's it might be, well, the use outside the company might be iffy, but um, reporting is quite a powerful management tool at this point in time for the companies to know exactly what they are doing. What they produce outside perhaps is, uh, well, um, we can have our own opinions on that. Um, I, I think what uh, I'd like to, to really focus on is the part of stakeholder capture. And the stakeholders actually participate in two levels, and one is the standard setting level. They actually work with GRI. A lot of them do. But the problem is um, they get lost every time when they talk about we talk about technical details. I've been involved in several processes, and that is quite sad. And being engaged with the companies, because the stakeholders don't read, or, or quite a few of the stakeholders don't really read the, um, the, uh, the sustainability reports, they you don't use the reports to engage. Uh, in stakeholder dialogue, and that, uh, therefore it's not very effective. So I, I think you know, this is, we have to look at this in, in terms of a, a longer run, that we have to educate our students uh, who could potentially be stakeholders, and, and we should look at this in uh, a short-term fix, basically. Okay. Just very briefly, um, I agree with your statement that um, the purpose is really important. I think that's absolutely right. Um, I think that the in, I agree with you as well, Amanda, that carefully as we go, if we rush this and get it wrong, then we're in a worse mess because we won't have the chance again for a long time to sort it out. So I think we do have to take it carefully. Um, but I think a real issue that comes out from the comments that you've said is this is about democracy. This is about making people feel that they are part of this. And I feel at the moment... Ordinary citizens feel very excluded from political processes, from high corporate decision-making processes, and I think that is a major issue, and the, the stakeholder capture is part of that problem. We mustn't in, uh, go into stakeholder management, but stakeholder engagement. Thank you. So we must, uh, Yuri, very, very brief. We are over time now. Okay, don't worry. No, but you, you can have a okay. brief no, Just to react about uh, reporting, just to mention, because you are all lawyers, we're totally all lawyers, so I think this wording is important. We start speaking about financial reporting because the International Accounting Standard Committee was renamed in International Accounting Standard Board and decided to change the rule from accounting standards to financial reporting standards. Mm -hmm. So, it's, and this is why they start to move accounting into this information sphere. Or, of course, financial market cannot influence pricing without this communication use. And Bloomberg make money through it, and probably policymakers cannot live. They will feel very alone without all this communication flow. But I can personally live without TV. And business firms don't need TV to, to do their business. So let's think about reporting. There's something which do information about who get the money and when and who bear the cost and the risk. And at that point, accounting can matter, reporting is really essential. Thank you. Thank you. So we need reporting. We need, uh, as, as a means, not an end. Uh, it should be linked to, to clear duties in the company to, to change their performance, their core business, and then, well, then it could be, be useful. We will now have a, a coffee break, be back here at quarter to 11 shop. We will then move on to a double session before and after lunch on investors. Thank you. <laughs>